So right now your body's trying to step on the gas and kick up all of its enzyme pathways uh, and immune response to fight this virus. So don't knock that down with ibuprofen. Hey there, welcome to the Evolving Ageless podcast. This is the enlightened woman's antidote to aging. So I'm your host, Michelle Drylick, and I am on a mission to change the way women age. And so each week I'm joined by experts. And this week is a really important one. This is a follow-up to our first coronavirus COVID-19 discussion. It's probably about 18 days later. So I'm joined by Dr. Ellie Campbell. Dr. Campbell is has a practice in integrative functional and holistic medicine in the suburbs of Atlanta. You've met her before. She's incredible, amazing, focuses on the root causes of medicine and significant prevention of chronic diseases and all illnesses, which is why it's so exciting to have her here today. What I know is that Dr. Campbell, from the very beginning of COVID, has been researching it and speaking with colleagues and studying the way this virus is moving and spreading and evolving. And so we're really excited to have her back on joining me today. Hi, Dr. Campbell. How are you? Hi, Michelle. I'm great. I'm sheltering in place and I'm great. Oh, that's good. Yeah, we're doing the same. I think we're on probably two weeks of sheltering in place here in Tampa. So let's jump in. And I know that you've spoken with people who are on the front lines. You've done your research. You've got your own patient population that you're caring for. Why don't yes. you give us an update on what's going on? Yeah, so I think when we last spoke, we had only had about 24 deaths in the country. And as of today, we're up to almost 2,200 deaths. So that's a huge um, increase. So, and it's, it's devastating, as I predicted, the uh, intensive care units and hospitals, because everybody's getting sick at the same time. If this happened over the course of a flu virus season, uh, four months, five months, maybe six months for some flu seasons. Um, this is all happening in four weeks or three weeks. So everybody's sick all at the same time and we do not have the infrastructure to manage it. Um, the, the good news, the best news is that our children are protected. In general, children under 15 hardly get this. There have been zero deaths in children under age nine. So um, they're protected for reasons we're not exactly sure of, but I have a couple of ideas. Um, young people are generally less likely to get this. High risk groups remain high risk, and that's where the majority of the deaths have had been happening. But we're starting to see a subtle shift downward in the United States, where now 60% of people who are getting this virus and ending up in a hospital are between the ages of 18 and 59. So that is a shift. Um, we don't yet know the statistics picked apart by details if all of those patients are high risk because they're one of the following categories. Hypertension, diabetes, coronary vascular disease, um, coronary artery disease or hardening of the arteries in the heart. Um, those have been the three most uh, recognized. We're starting to see a bit more of the chronic lung disease patients have problems and a bit more of the autoimmune disease patients having problems and a bit more obesity showing up as a risk factor. So um, don't yet know in those slightly younger populations that have been downshifted just a little bit if they are all in those high risk categories or if there's some that truly have zero risk who are hospitalized anyhow. We don't know yet, it's too soon. Wow, so I've heard that myself that, that the population that's younger is actually succumbing now. Um, yeah. What do we think that's, so we, as you just said, it's not necessarily that they were in the risk factor, but I do know that um, what I'm hearing or what I'm reading is folks that are on the front lines have a much higher exposure level and they seem yeah. to be hospitalized more frequently. Right. Is that true? So that is true. And so these are our, these are the people we need the most in a health crisis, right? These frontline right. workers, these are people that are um, caring for us in the healthcare industry. These are people that are transporting us to and from our homes during emergencies. These are people that are keeping our streets safe, the paramedics, 
the police officers, the firefighters, because, you know, all that stuff that happens in regular life is still happening behind the scenes. People still have heart attacks and people still fall down the stairs and break their legs. And um, this is a challenge when your emergency room is full to the brim with uh, COVID-19 patients and you need health care for a non-COVID related issue. Besides that, we have the other people that are sort of behind the scenes that we don't think about. People at gas stations to make sure that all these people have fuel. Uh, people who are um, in housekeeping who have to clean up the mess. People in um, the funeral industry, uh, they're having a significant increase and in hot spots, it's overwhelming them too. Uh, these frontline people are seem to be at greater risk and we want to provide personal protective equipment to them as rapidly as possible. Let's talk about testing because I know yeah. there's this big buzz, right? I know there's a need for testing, um, but also I know there's a huge desire in the population, like everyone wants to be tested. Right. What's your, what, what's going on with that? What do you think about that? Right. So the, uh, the testing is predominantly for antibodies to this virus. Uh, in the hospital, we're looking at viral load. So mm -hmm. does the patient have actual virus in their system? This can be misleading though. I have one of my colleagues who lost her mother-in-law two days ago uh, to COVID-19. She had been in the hospital with kidney stones two weeks prior. They presumed that's where she got it. When she went back to the emergency room with a fever, they presumed she had a urinary tract infection related to the, um, the instrumentation from her kidney stones. Mm -hmm. uh, they tested her for COVID, it was negative. Her symptoms got worse and she started to show signs of pneumonia. So they tested her again and it was still negative. And then they, uh, she ended up in the ICU um, in, intubated on a ventilator and they tested her a third time and that time it came up positive and she died 24 hours later. So the testing is not perfect. And um, if your immune system is not controlling it, um, the, it's, let's say for example, you have a super, super weak immune system. You could have virus everywhere and no antibodies detected. Mm. Um, the IgM antibody, we think that's, a, your immune system has lots of different arms. It's like an octopus mm -hmm. and fights infection lots of different ways. One of those ways is through um, cells that make antibodies. Antibodies come in, in five different kinds. IgM is the first responder antibiotic, antibody, so it shows up first to activate the immune system to say we've got a problem. Then downstream, a few days to a few weeks later, IgG becomes positive. So we're looking at IgG markers as a marker of immunity and IgM as a marker of, I just recently caught this virus. Exposure. Those, almost all of our exposure, right? Almost all of our conventional laboratories are ramping up their capacity to do these tests. But right now, they're just not available. Everybody wants a test, but mm -hmm. everybody can't have a test. One physician colleague of mine was featured in the uh, Atlanta Journal-Constitution editorial with the title, How Sick Is This?, talking about our healthcare system because he was employed by a major hospital system. He had just quit his job and two weeks later got sick. Fever, muscle aches, chest pain, shortness of breath, fatigue, um, hard shaking chills, cough so severe that he thought he was going to pass out multiple times. Mm. So I called employee health and he asked them if he could have a COVID-19 test. And they said, no, you're not sick enough. We're only testing people who are sick enough to be in the hospital and you're not sick enough yet. So as an integrative care physician, he did all the myriad things that we will talk about to help himself at home. And he started to feel a little bit better, but he was still trying to get himself tested. So he called his primary care provider. His primary care provider said, no, we don't have any tests, call the health department. So that he called the public health department who said, call the CDC. And so he called the CDC and after two hours on hold and he finally got to talk to somebody, they said, call your primary care provider. Oh. So, <laughs> right. That's so exactly here right. is a primary care, brilliant, integrative family physician who is sick, who can't even get a test. So right. that I feel the frustration for everybody who just wants to know did I already have this? Am I already immune? Do I not need to be so strict about my social distancing? Is my family not at risk for me coming and going from work because I've already had it? 
um, what are the dangers of um, having asymptomatic transmission? And we know that that's probably why this virus is spreading so rapidly. Um, younger people in particular, the, the children, the teens, the tweens, the 20s, uh, have very, very mild symptoms, if any at all, in most cases. Mm -hmm. uh, yet, we detect virus in their throats and in their nasopharynx and in their gastrointestinal tracts. Mm -hmm. um, and so we know that in some studies, stool can remain positive for COVID-19 virus, which is called SARS-CoV-2. SARS-CoV-2 is the name of the virus. COVID-19 is the name of the disease. The virus is detectable in stool 47 days after the onset of symptoms. We don't yet know if fecal oral transmission is possible or proven, but it seems likely. So that means in a respiratory patient who's recovered, who had mild or moderate symptoms, their dirty toilet bowl might be contagious for 47 days after they're sick. And that wow. might be part of the reason how this virus is spreading through our community through these hidden ways. There's some thought wow. now that um, anything you touch in the grocery store could be contaminated. That can of beans that the person in front of you touched and then put back on the shelf, or perhaps the produce that everybody wants to touch and squeeze before they purchase to make sure it's optimally a uh, stage of ripeness for how they need it today. Um, all those things potentially could be a, uh, no symptoms, no obvious sign of virus. It does, it's not like glitter, you know? If, if you imagine that you had the virus and it had glitter on it, and then time you touch something, you could see the trail of glitter. Right. It's not like that. We don't see it, we don't smell it. We don't know that right. it's there, but it's potentially contagious. You know, uh, my kids are 15 and 13, and my husband and I, uh, a friend of ours told us about the show Scrubs. I don't know if you remember that show from the from the 90s, but they did an episode on how viruses transmit and mm -hmm. with with it ultimately ending in death of an elderly person that was oh. not a part of the the chain of of disease being right. passed. But it's a great show. It was, I believe it was season five, episode 12. Yeah. If you want kids to understand because they seem to get their hands everywhere. And, right. Uh, it, it's good for them to see it visually. They use like a little green, you know, haze all over where people are touching one another. So I think that's a really good one. So to go back to testing, though, I just want to make sure everyone's clear, like testing is only a result that minute, right? That time right. that you actually swab or draw blood or whatever, that's the that's the moment. So it doesn't it's not the end all be all for us today. Like we don't it's have, not. right. So if someone has symptoms and we'll get to the real details later, that's when you wanna call your doctor and kick off this process. But it was so enlightening probably for another physician to be caught in the system and see how that, how the toss around, you know, trying to just find care. Right. So I'm glad now, that they're Now two well. weeks, four weeks, 10 weeks from now, we may have a different story to tell. Totally. When there That's are right. commercially available tests and every hospital has them and practices have them. Mm -hmm. In Georgia, where I am right now, the way that it works is you have to meet enough criteria to be tested. Uh, I call the health, as a physician, you're my patient, you say, I've got symptoms X, Y, and Z. And I call the health department and I describe your symptoms and they say, okay, that sounds like somebody worthy of being tested. Here's their um, test ID number and test location. And they're mm -hmm. setting up remote tents, uh, mostly outdoor, uh, underneath tents where people are in their cars driving by and getting swabbed. Um, and they do that by appointment with a case number. Because once you have a case number, you're considered a person under investigation and you must remain sheltering in place, uh, pretty much quarantine, not just sheltering in place, because sheltering in place does allow a few comings and goings. Uh, mm -hmm. But when you're quarantined, you're in one room by yourself. Um, and so that's what they're asking the people who are under investigation to do is go home, be by yourself, one bathroom only for you, have people deliver your meals. We don't want you wandering about your house while you're under investigation. So mm -hmm. that's a much stricter criterion once you're actually being tested. That's great. So that's that kind of covers, well, maybe not. What do you do? When you get sick, what if right. you have these symptoms? What are you telling your patients? 
So what I'm telling my patients is to begin to kick up your supplement regimen. So we hopefully have been taking vitamin D, vitamin C, vitamin, uh, sorry, and the minerals, magnesium, zinc, and selenium. Hopefully people have been taking all of those. If you're suddenly sick, I ask you to kick up your uh, zinc from 20 milligrams a day to around 100 to 200 milligrams a day of zinc because we think zinc inhibits the replication of the virus. Um, we also ask you to take that zinc with something called a zinc ionophore, which helps the zinc get into the cell membrane a little better. Those are quercetin, which comes mostly from onions, other food sources as well, uh, tonic water, quinine, and um, EGCG, the active ingredient in green tea. So I've asked you to kick up one of those beverages uh, or foods with your zinc. We ask that you um, get in an Epsom salt bath that's been spiked with pine needles. Isn't that interesting, right? Mm. So go out to ba your backyard, capture two, three, four handfuls of pine needles, rub them between your hands to break up the little needles, get in a tub with Epsom salts and these pine needles. There are many reasons why these terpenes, which is that active pine smell ingredient, it's antimicrobial. It, it seems to reduce uh, bacteria and viruses from replicating. And also the terpenes open up the bronchial tubes. Mm -hmm. Another thing I recommend is that you get good old fashioned salt and make a hypertonic salt solution, uh, which is one quart of water and two tablespoons of Himalayan pink sea salt. Um, mix it together, make sure the water is boiled and cooled and sterilized or distilled, not straight from the tap. Make it baby bottle temperature so it's not too hot, not too cold and rinse your nose and gargle. This virus predominantly begins in the upper respiratory symptom and then drops into the lungs. So if we can reduce the number of virus particles in the nose and mouth, then we should, in theory, be able to reduce the number of uh, viruses that get down into the bronchial tree. Um, and so we that's with those squirt bottles, the nasal You can use a squirt bottle, you can pot. use a neti pot. I use a Grosin nasal irrigator, which sort of looks mm -hmm. like a water pick um, yep. and pulses into the nose. I've actually been doing that two to three times a day, every day, um, since I first learned about this about 10 days ago, uh, as a preventative, because um, last week we were still at the office, still doing some IVs and procedures and you know routine primary care, some People have other things besides COVID and need to be seen. So um, in my office complex, I'm on the second story of a, of a shopping mall. There's elevators and handrails and doorknobs. And I try very hard to not touch all those things and not touch my face. And we have a protocol now. Everybody stops at the door, runs to the bathroom, washes their hands before they're even allowed to walk in our room. Then this as soon as your feet hit the inside of the office, you get your temperature taken as a staff employee. Um, so we're doing everything that we can to make sure we're not protected. But then as soon as I get home, I wash my nose with salt water, mm -hmm. hoping that should any viruses been in the air on the surfaces that they're gonna not stick on me. Right. Another thing that we recommend once you've been exposed is that you start taking, if you happen to have a nebulizer at home, one of those machines that pumps mist, uh, put peroxide in there. About uh, three millimeters of straight out of the bo brown bottle, regular hydrogen peroxide inhaled as a mist has antiviral properties. Now, mm. this is not sanctioned by the CDC. This is not uh, FDA approved, but this is an old fashioned home remedy that many doctors have been using for years for other viruses, including the cold virus, which is a coronavirus of a different type. Um, if you do not have a nebulizer, I asked my experts in the industry if uh, putting it in one of your diffusers that you commonly have for essential oils, mm -hmm. if that would work, if you just put your face over the diffuser and inhale that he said it's a poor substitute, but if that's all you've got, by all means use it. Great. So, right. If so people, there's that. Of essential oils. What if people have pine essential oil? Can you put that in a yeah, bath? So, so probably you could put that in the bath. No reason okay. that I can think of not to. Um, another thought is immediately upon hearing that you have the virus, do not take ibuprofen. 
Um, there has been some studies that suggest that it worsens the inflammatory response. Um, it's a straight, you know, normally you think of ibuprofen as an anti-inflammatory, but yet in this particular virus, the way that it works downstream, uh, blocking this certain pathway that ibuprofen does really seems to make people do worse. And many of the deaths uh, in uh, young people, they've had ibuprofen in their bloodstream. So do not take ibuprofen. What do you do if you have a fever? Well, first of all, fever is mother nature's way of kicking it up a notch, right? Of revving up your system. If you're sitting in an intersection and you need to go fast, you stomp on the gas. That's not the time when you want to take the gas away from the car, right? So right now your body's trying to step on the gas and kick up all of its enzyme pathways uh, and immune response to fight this virus. So don't knock that down with ibuprofen. Mm, if, you're, if your fever is much above 103, or if you're just so miserable that you can't eat, can't sleep, can't think, can't do any of the self-care things we recommend, and your fever needs treatment, the first thing to do is get in a tepid bath. So temperature of the bath, somewhere around 97 degrees, 96 degrees, get in that bath, it will cool down your body temperature. Um, it, we have been advised people in the past to get um, a ice pack and put it in your groin and your armpits. Those are pulse points where your blood is very close to the surface of the skin and a cool compress in those areas can bring down the fever quite nicely. Our naturopathic friends at Bastyr University have a lovely online wet sock treatment where you get two pairs of pajamas, two pairs of socks, ideally one is wool and one is light, make the, soak the wool socks in an ice bath and put on the ice cold um, socks, cover them with another pair, get in pajamas and expect that you will have a fever spike very shortly to break the fever and you may even need to change pajamas. So mm. we can post that recipe for your listeners from Bastyr University for the wet sock That's treatment. A great deal. I love it. If you must take something, Tylenol is the recommended remedy. Now, Tylenol is interesting because the way that, or the way that Tylenol is metabolized through your liver after it's kind of brought your fever down and your aches and your pains is that it depletes uh, N-acetylcysteine in the liver. De de sorry, it depletes glutathione in the liver. Glutathione is your master antioxidant. And the precursor molecule that's used to make glutathione is NAC. In the hospital, unrelated to COVID-19, if somebody presents to the hospital in an emergency because they've overdosed on Tylenol, we give them this molecule called NAC. Many of us have NAC in our pantries, in our supplement closets, because it promotes the production of glutathione, which is an antioxidant, and we know that oxidative stress ages us, so we want to have less oxidation, less rusting of our enzyme pathways, and NAC can help that. So Tylenol burns through glutathione really quickly, and NAC can be supplemented at the time you're taking your Tylenol. This depletion of n sorry, this depletion of glutathione from taking Tylenol is associated with Tylenol-related deaths in viral syndromes. So never ever take Tylenol if you are too sick to eat because the starvation kicks up this NAPKI enzyme pathway that burns through your glutathione. So if you must take Tylenol, ideally take it with NAC. I am so glad you covered that because I think people always just interchange ibuprofen and Tylenol and reflex to Tylenol. And yes. it, it's, you know, I've heard in several different circles that if it had to go through approval, FDA approval today, it would be much different than when it was approved because yeah, it would be prescription only about. for sure. Yeah, aspirin as well. Yeah, yeah. yeah. right. Um, and another okay. point is that if from a cardiovascular, remember most of the patients who have COVID-19 symptoms also have cardiovascular risk factors, diabetes, hypertension, atherosclerosis of their coronary arteries. In that patient population, unrelated to COVID-19, many, many studies have been done on the safety of anti-inflammatories for mm -hmm. stomach ulcers and for triggering heart attacks and strokes. Mm -hmm. And in those meta-analyses, it has been proven over and over again that the safest drug is naproxen. It's much safer than ibuprofen in general, unrelated to COVID-19. 
So if you're one of those people for whom uh, Tylenol did nothing, the wet sock treatment did nothing, the ice packs in your groin and, um, and armpits did nothing, and your fever is climbing, and you're, you, you're grasping at straws, naproxen, a leave would be your drug of choice. Wonderful advice. Okay, super. All right, so let's talk about what you should have in your house now since we're all, I mean, most, there's no, uh, I think there are limited cities right now that are on true restriction. Mm -hmm. But if we're sheltering in place and we can go to the store, wear a glove, right? Right. What else? And, so go to the store. Right. What things do we want to have in our house that we can pick up? Right. So I would say, first of all, in your family, designate a specific shopper right? Only let one person go. Don't go as a couple just because it's your outing, right? We want to minimize exposure. So designate one, the healthiest person in the house to be your shopper. If possible, use a drive through to get your food or pharmacy. Don't go in the store at all because going into the store increases the probability you're going to be touching things that other people have touched. If possible, order online and pay by the phone. I have not seen studies about the uh, viral contamination of the keypads for ATM cards, but I expect they are. And mm -hmm. so um, if you have to use your ATM card at a store, use a cleaning wipe or a glove before you touch the keypad. Also gas pumps if you're out and about uh, and you're picking, touching a gas pump, make sure you're wearing a glove. Keep your purse off the counter of the, of mm. the grocery store. Don't put it in that seat where the baby with the dirty diaper just sat. Um, so, uh, and then you can, if, if you're truly out, we have recipes for homemade hand washing supplies, um, hand sanitizers that can be made at home if you're totally out and don't have access to a cleaning solution. What should oh, you great. pick well, up? Awesome. Yeah, what should you pick up at the store? Well, I think it's important that you have non-perishable foods right? Things that are going to last a long time. If you're going to go out, by all means, pick up fresh things. This is our best time. It's recommended that those get washed in soap and water before you consume them. I am not in the habit of washing my vegetables with soap and water beforehand, but I will be now. Mm. Um, what I don't grow in my garden, fortunately, outside, I have a lovely uh, winter garden that I started and I have lots of spring lettuces and um, mustard greens and kale and spinach that uh, has been wintering really nicely. So I have access oh, to a few of those things. But not everybody does. So if you have to use your opportunity out to buy as much produce as you think you can eat in a few days time, don't over purchase it unless you want to uh, parboil it and freeze it. Uh, assuming you have room in your freezer. Mine is pretty stuffed with proteins um, that I have prepared for, uh, you know, several, I have at least four weeks of, of um, fish and turkey and ground beef from my, uh, from my farmer all in the freezer. So non-perishable foods, rice and beans, great choice. Um, I like sardines. I think sardines are a great high protein, uh, good source of essential fatty acids, uh, great, uh, shelf stable food, shelf stable protein. So is jerky, nut butters. We want to avoid as much as possible the temptation to eat the snack food when we are home. Uh, snow day, all right, this is our excuse. We're gonna eat chips treats. and treats and we're gonna make cookies and we're gonna enjoy all these sweet and forbidden foods that we don't normally eat. This is not a snow day. This is a long range situation and I expect that uh, I'm making a prediction probably June or July is when we're probably going to be released from most of our restrictions. We hope mm. we hope that this coronavirus has a seasonal variation and decreases its infectivity as the weather gets warmer and more humid. Um, so avoid white sugar foods, avoid um, concentrated of white flour, white sugar, anything with those things in it should probably not be eaten. Avoid the chips. Um, nuts and seeds are great choices. Canned vegetables are great choices. When you're choosing a canned vegetable, try to choose one that's dark in color, that's organic. The can says BPA free if possible. Um, we also have stocked up on lots of different protein powders. I have mm -hmm. pea protein, rice protein, whey protein uh, in my a shelf just in case if we if it gets down to it and we just have to have shakes for breakfast and lunch and one meal a day we've done that before that we call that a cleanse 
Um, and we can do that for weeks on end. So we have plenty of protein powders on hand. Great. So let's talk about this. I've heard now, I don't know if it's just in Tampa, but I know there are a lot of healthcare workers talking about this idea that there are two strains of, of uh, SARS-CoV-2. Two. So yeah. tell us what you know about that. Yeah, from my research, it remains that the virus is still SARS-CoV-2. If there was a second strain, it would have a second name. That being said, the virus is mutating and single RNA nucleotides are, are changing as it jumps from country to country. The virus is mutating just a little bit, but not enough to be a completely different strain of virus. So how its infectivity changes, how the clinical outcomes change, we don't know yet, it's too soon. Uh, it's, we have virologists feverishly working and publishing articles faster than ever before in the history of humankind on all those questions. So we'll have more answers in a few weeks, few months, few years, but we don't have them yet. Also, there's this idea that it's viral, we develop antibodies, so therefore we are likely to not be able to catch it again. However, we're hearing that some of the research and what's showing up in some other countries is that people are presenting twice. Right. Any thoughts on that? So, yeah, uh, again, more questions than answers. The theories that I have seen from most of my experts is that it's not so much that it's a recurrent, a second infection, but it's that the first infection was never cured. So we know many viruses, think for example, chickenpox, can live in a nerve root for decades and come out at a later time as shingles. It's the same virus presenting two different ways. Um, we think about a cold sore virus. You'll have a cold sore, the virus lives in that skin 24 seven, but you only show manifestation of it periodically. Mm -hmm. And we think that this may be true for this virus too, that it is, um, the viral counts reduced enough, symptoms go away, and then it kind of shows back up again. Um, there's also this, we're certain that some patients are gonna have post COVID-19 syndrome the damage that this virus has caused to the lungs with pulmonary fibrosis is extreme. And many patients are probably going to end up with permanent lung scarring and disability to their lungs, their hearts, their brains, and their kidneys. And so with all that collateral damage from the virus, people are being readmitted, it may not be a second round of virus per se. In other words, they didn't catch it again. They're just manifesting symptoms from their post COVID-19 syndrome. Mm. Well, and especially after what you said with stool showing positive for 47 days, 42, right. 42 days, seven. No, it's 47. It is 47, 47 days. It seems like that exposure could just continually happen. So right. that's really fascinating. So here's something really interesting that you said that I really want to follow up on here. We're thinking of this as, you know, we know 80% of the population will recover just fine from this. Some will not even recognize the symptoms as severe. Um, you know, I've, what I've read, another 15% are, are getting severe symptoms and 5% are being hospitalized and experiencing uh, potentially death. But even in this group of 80%, you know, we forget that if we get COVID-19 and we recover from COVID-19, that's not to say that we, we come out of it unscathed. So I guess the point here is I don't want to scare tactic people, but at the same time, it's another reason why I think we want to be super diligent to limit exposure right now until right. we figure out at least, you know, when we're working on flattening the curve, we're also extending time to nail down our testing and get that more accurate to come up with other alternative treatments. And for instance, I've just, I saw um, recently that hospitals just through the network of grapevine talk have learned to intubate patients differently um, right. and increase survival rates. So, you know, right. the more we flatten the curve, it's not just, the hospitals, it's, it's, we're extending our ability to learn and, and treat more effectively. Right. The, the hardest part about this is historically, if a patient with a viral syndrome presents to the emergency room sick enough to be intubated, 
the vast majority of the time they will recover because it's not a chronic disease, it's an acute one. And so with the proper supportive care of their blood pressure and killing off any secondary infections and supporting their lungs ability to oxygenate, they usually pull through. This is sadly not the case with coronavirus. The vast majority of people who are sick enough to be intubated will not um, recover. They will succumb to their illness. And it's also somewhat fascinating in the syndrome that some people are recovering enough to be extubated, to get through the respiratory problems that this virus has caused, and their lungs recover enough, but the collateral damage results in a cardiac death one to three days later. And mm -hmm. so how devastating that is for families to think this roller coaster of I'm going to lose my family member, I'm going to lose my family member. Oh my gosh, they made it there. Maybe we won't lose them. And then they die a cardiac death. And this is happening even in young people, 18, 20, 30, 50 year olds without chronic illness is this virus attacks their heart muscle and the heart muscle just stops working. And um, it's, it's fascinating. The mechanism by which that happens seems to be through the voltage gated calcium channels and the calcium gets all uh, wonky in the heart muscle you need that calcium for the heart muscle cells to contract and and in this virus something happens to that pathway and it doesn't work what's equally fascinating to me is that we have learned that electromagnetic frequency radiation from 4g and 5g networks also affects that same calcium gated a voltage gated calcium channel. Hmm. So what does that mean? That means that maybe, just maybe, exposure to EMF might be a risk factor for severe outcomes. Hmm. So at home, that might be another thing we can do. Let's disconnect our Wi-Fi. What harm is there in that? Let's turn our cell phones to the airplane mode so that they're not seeking signals and emitting quite as much electromagnetic frequency while we're holding them because everybody's spending a lot more hours on their phones this last two, four, six weeks than we have ever in the past. So let's minimize our risk. Let's keep those cell phones at least an arm's length away from us while we sleep at night. Let's turn the Wi-Fi off when we're not using it. Let's try to limit our screen time. Very challenging to do, but make it a game. Set a time for yourselves and your children of how much screen time they're allowed and how they're going to get that screen time and try to stick to it. One of the blessings in this um, uh, pandemic is that families are connecting with each other in ways we have not seen before in this generation. Uh, for some unknown reason, I, I have three children. They're 20, 23, and 24 years old, and they all live in their own apartments. So they're all sheltering in their own places. But for Christmas, I bought each of them a Scrabble board, a um, deck of cards, and a boggle game. Mm -hmm. And each of them have roommates and have been playing untold hours worth of Scrabble. And what a blessing that is, right, to be mm -hmm. connecting with the people that you live with, uh, we FaceTime with them almost every day, my husband and the three girls, and we are talking and we are valuing the relationships that we have in untold ways. And that can be a blessing. People have found that there's stuff that they can do outside walking. As long as we're six feet distance, that has not been taken away from each other. So we take our dogs for a walk. We walk through the neighborhood. We go... Um, to the, the local park um, and spend time in nature because these are fabulous ways to help reduce the mental health right. uh, let's, um, negative well, let's effects. Talking, right, let's keep yeah. talking with mental health because I feel like the more we, you know, my husband will always say, stop reading the news, yes. <laughs> just relax. So right. I'm, I'm learning. I've started painting yesterday. I was Yay! roses and beach scenes and, and, uh, right. <laughs> so, right. I called it Porta somewhere Elsa. <laughs> right. <laughs> I, <painted> it. <laughs> I love it. <laughs> yeah, yeah. So right. let's so talk about I, mental I health because these are trying times for, for certain people. Well, I for would actually say for everybody, yeah. you know, we talk about maybe somewhere between 40 and 70% of humans in the United States are going to 
contract coronavirus, 80 to 85% will have mild or moderate symptoms. But in my world, 100% of everybody that I've spoken to is having some type of mental health issue related to this, whether it's just increased fear or insomnia or anxiety, or two, two of my kids had full on panic attacks. Uh, not a common thing for them, but they were just feeling the overwhelm of how long is it going to last? I've been sheltering for two weeks. How come nobody else is sheltering? How long do I have to keep going? If I'd known, maybe I shouldn't have sheltered. And then, right, all these questions all in it. your head, automatic negative thoughts pop up. So what can you do? Well, I think you exercise control where you have control. So that's a huge mental health um, prevention strategy for for many people. So first of all, let's talk about your schedule. Nobody does well in a random schedule. So mm -hmm. if you are one of those hero moms who is also a school teacher, who is having to do daycare for their toddler, homeschooling for their kids who are normally in school, and teach lessons for their kids that they teach, those ladies are men, dads and moms that are doing that just have my utmost e extreme respect and admiration that they can pull that off and they can't do that without a schedule. So you're going to set your schedule of what's your breakfast time, what's your uh, hy hygiene time, how long are you going to be in the shower, what time do lessons start, what do you do for your break, when is lunch time, when is your study time, when's your break time, when's meal prep time, who does what, whose job is it, uh, make time for chores and then make time for fun stuff and put it all in a schedule. And if you've not done that prior, this is a really good time to learn how. That's we great. also believe that having an accountability partner to help you stick to that schedule once you've decided that, that it's one that works is a really nice strategy. I feel like our children are on a schedule naturally from school, right? So right. this period of time, they're almost craving that schedule and it's almost forcing us into that schedule with them. So it's it's great to be able to have this predictability to your day, but even yes. factoring in some stress reduction time, the time for walk, exercise, right? We've always said right. poor man's Prozac, right? So if right. you're finding yourself stressed and, and you it's palpable, right? We can all feel it. There's nothing like a little workout or even a walk or something in nature um, to just kind of alleviate that that stress. Agreed. Totally. I also think it's important that you get dressed for the day. My brother made a joke that he put on his um, work jacket on top of, he had to coordinate the color of his pajamas to match his work jacket <laughs> because you take your morning pajamas off at nine o'clock and put your nighttime pajamas on at nine at, at nine at night. And I think that that's a bad strategy. I think mm -hmm. most of us feel more productive if we're dressed in our work clothes. So I do recommend that we do that. Um, there's a mental connection that happens when you're dressed for work, you're ready to work. So that I think can help the kids too. Don't just let them lounge around in their pajamas doing their homework all day, put them in their school clothes and mm -hmm. maybe not a school uniform for those who are inclined, <laughs> but maybe, maybe their school uniform shirt. Like I had a mom that homeschooled her kids, a physician friend of mine. And during that school year, she bought her children school uniforms. And on school days, that was after breakfast, they went and put on their homeschool school uniform. And that was their mental trigger that it was time to do work. That's a great idea. That's a great idea. Um, so let's talk about movement because you talked about exercise, but there's some specific types of movement that have been shown to shift your sympathetic parasympathetic balance into more calming rest and digest mode. And those are yoga, Tai Chi, Kijong and some forms of dance. So don't forget to look for those things online. All so many generous, generous teachers of these modalities are yeah. giving their time free. So uh, a service that you used to had to pay $20, $30, $50 a month for is often free right now. So take advantage of those. Learn how to do something. Um, my daughter is posting a planking challenge online with all of her um, teammates. Their season was canceled for the entire year. They don't get to do world championships. They were number five in the world, and now they're not going to perform. So her emotional devastation of having that taken away from her, uh, college students everywhere, high school kids are probably not going to have graduation ceremonies. Um, 
certainly not in May or June when they're planned, possibly later in the summer, July or August, we might be able to have a graduation ceremony, but it's gonna be a challenge. And these, these people feel severe grief and loss for the yes. things that they had planned that they're, that they're lacking. So a little yoga, a little Tai Chi can go a long way. Prayer and meditation are, you cannot underestimate the value of that. I have always done my morning meditations free. There's lots of now free meditations that you used mm -hmm. to have to pay for are also available online. Um, I am a big fan of the gratitude journal. We know that negative thoughts beget negative thoughts. And the more you're trapped in the things in your head that you can't have, the more you think about the things that you can't have and the worse it fuels. But the opposite is true. If you write down the things that you're grateful for, the more things you find to be grateful for. I think a nice exercise for especially the young people is to get out a paper journal and record their thoughts and feelings, emotions, observations of what society looks like these weeks. Um, over the next weeks and months, those observations are going to be powerful for their children and grandchildren to read mm. 100 or 200 years from now. I would recommend they don't put it online because that's not going to survive um, internet crashes and software updates, but a paper journal will. So um, we still read my, my father-in-law's World War II letters that he sent home from the front lines of Normandy Beach. And... Um, we still read those. So I think mm -hmm. writing down those thoughts in a journal at this time is a really powerful mental health strategy to dump some of those thoughts on paper so that you don't have to keep rattling them around in your head and end every journal entry with a, something you're grateful for. Absolutely. It's a good so, time to read, color, paint, mm -hmm. create Love art. It. And I agree with you 100%, limit your, your time in the news. If you need to watch the news, find a headline, watch it 30 minutes and turn it off. Mm -hmm. Another fun thing that we're doing is, you know, we've never really, you know, we've got kids and jobs and the hustle and bustle of everything. We're not in our home that much. And now that we are, it's a great time to do our spring cleaning right? Yes. We've already emptied our garage and had that hauled away. We're emptying closets, bedrooms, changing things around. So it's a great time. You know, I, in times of stress, and I notice that the older I get, the, the more uh, important it becomes for me to be in a serene environment, right? So, mm -hmm. so the whole tidying things up, keeping things neat, redesigning, it's just, right. it's occupying ourselves and we're working together as a family doing it. So yep. or organization and efficiency breed calmness, right? Mm -hmm. And yeah. so when your desk is chaotic and it, my husband jokes, I'm not a, a doctor, I'm a pilot because I have a pile here and a pile there and a pile everywhere. <laughs> it's how my brain works, right? But trying to reduce and organize those piles and make you know, we've got a blessing here. We don't have to do our taxes by April 15th. So right. now's a great time for you to sort through all those papers and do your best ever job at taxes because now you can find all the right papers that you actually needed that you normally don't find until the next year. So this right. is a good time to do that too, right? That's so That's um, minimize the chaos in your life by identifying it, clearing it up, um, and recognizing that we have become a culture of excess. Yes. We don't need We're a lot of the that. stuff that we need. And this is, this is giving us an opportunity to uh, write, hold the mirror to our own face and look at the gluttony and look at the excess of the things that we've collected that we probably don't need. And now they're just creating chaos in our homes. And if we get rid of them, someone else will find a use for them. Don't throw them in the trash. Donate them. Get your donations. Uh, you can use those on your taxes in most cases. But even if you can't, please repurpose them, recycle them, find an opportunity. Don't just put them in the trash dump somewhere. That's right. So I want to end this on, you know, I think the, the big message in the news right now as of today and the last week has been the scarcity and the shortage of supplies in our hospitals and in our doctor's offices. And so I know that when this whole thing began, we joked about the toilet paper disappearing from the shelves, which it's still gone, uh, yes. the paper towels, the tissues, the napkins. 
But the other thing that was happening is that there was a group, you know, not a group, but just people around the country that started collecting masks and gloves and assuming that they were going to need this the, to hoard medical supplies. And where we are now as a nation is that we are, these are in short supply, even for our practitioners. Um, and construction workers use the same masks that hospitals use. So if anyone has a, a containers of masks or gloves or anything that they would want to donate, what is your advice? Where can they go? Now is a good time for us to bring together and give that stuff to the people who need it most. Yes, we, um, you know, family physicians are in a unique position right now because there's not a lot that we can do when people are sick. They're either well enough to shelter at home or they're sick enough to need the hospital and there's not a whole lot in between. So um, we did some of that sorting, organizing, cleaning up, checking expiration dates, purging of our office closet because we were still in the office and weren't seeing so many patients. So we used that time to do exactly what we talked about. And I had a bunch of extra medical supplies, including from the Ebola scare, two of those zip up white hazmat suits. Well, I don't really need them. So I called the CEO of my local hospital because I have direct line to her. And she asked me to contact my local community health center because they can use them. So we donated all the unneeded supplies to our local community health center. Uh, for people in your community, if they do indeed have supplies, I would suggest um, calling their local health department to see where they might donate them, calling the local, the nurse's station, not the doctors, but the nurse's station of their local emergency room call the hospital 800 number, ask for the nurse's station at the hospital and say, you know, I'm, I have found in my basement three boxes of gloves, 10 masks and whatever, can, can you use them? And they either will have a place for you to send them, use them, leave them on the sidewalk outside the emergency room and run away, or they'll have another opportunity, a different place where they're collecting supplies. You know, you have to realize too that those supplies are now being kept in places where people could have asymptomatic coronavirus infections. Absolutely. So when you get your supplies delivered from your medical supply house, you don't have to worry about that so much. But if they've been sheltered in someone's kitchen, um, it's possible that they could, those very supplies could be contaminated. So don't be surprised if there's some restriction on who can have what. Mm -hmm. um, and it might need to go to a staging place where it has to sit for five to seven days uh, before it can be used. Wonderful. So. Wow. So this was really thorough. I think we've covered so many different aspects from who's at risk, what's happening on the front lines in hospitals to strains to uh, being able to contract the virus more than once all the way through to mental health. Any last thoughts? Yeah, I have one. It's going to go, it's going to be gone eventually. Mm -hmm. it, we will have a new order, a new, uh, things will be different. Some people will lose those that they love. Some people will have permanent disability, but the vast majority of us are going to be fine on the other side. And so we need to start planning for that. Start thinking optimistically about what your post COVID-19 life is going to look like. Where are you going to go on vacation next year? Where are you going to do with your kids? What are you going to, what's your bucket list? How are you going to start getting some of those things taken care of? Because now you have the time to actually look and, and organize those things. Another thing that we didn't talk about, and I sort of hate to leave on a somber note, is make sure that your advanced directives for healthcare and wills are up to date, that all those paperwork that people know, if you get hit by a bus, which is still, you're still more likely to die from a car accident than you are to die from COVID-19. But we wanna make sure that people know how you wanna be taken care of in your final days of life, regardless of what that might look like. So. So do that, but look forward to the fun things. Spend time with your family, spend time in nature. Uh, these are trying times for all of us, but being with the people and things that you love can make it less stressful. I love that. I think that's a wonderful way to end today. Dr. Ellie Campbell, thank you so much. It's been wonderful. We're going to create links to all the things that we talked about today to help people out from the from the best sure university all the way down to maybe even your daughter's plank challenge so <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs>
thanks again for taking the time out of your immensely busy schedule. We really appreciate it. And for everyone else, I hope you've enjoyed this COVID update. We'll continue to bring updates to you um, as long as there's news and things are changing. So it's been wonderful. Again, we'll talk to you next week. So we'll, we'll meet you here in the same place at the same time. Bye for now.